Our bodies come in different shapes and sizes, so doesn't it make sense that our weight loss plan should too? Noom builds a personal plan that factors in dietary restrictions, medical issues, and other personal needs so your plan works for you. One of the things I love about Noom is that it doesn't feel restrictive. Instead of focusing on what you can't eat, it helps you develop a healthier relationship with food. You can still enjoy your favorite treats in moderation, which makes it a sustainable approach that I can actually stick to. If you're looking for a personalized weight loss program that actually works, I highly recommend giving Noom a try. It's a program that's helped me achieve my goals and feel better than ever. Stay focused on what's important to you with Noom's psychology and biology-based approach. Sign up for your trial today at Noom.com. That's N-O-O-M.com. Go check out Noom today. I think that midlife gives us this opportunity to really start to relate to ourselves possibly in a new way and continue to ask ourselves what feelings are here for me as I am in this challenging period of time. Using some of your experiences of pain, sadness, loss, grief, anger, you know, We, in our culture, want to bypass these feelings. You can have healthy communities. You can look toward elders, but you can also connect with other people going through this process. People who have wisdom to share or people who can just support you as you go through this. And I think that that can be incredibly fruitful. Like it's nice to have that little house within your side of yourself, but it's also nice to connect with other people through this process and find a shared experience here. That was Dr. Meg McKelvey and me, Dr. Debbie Sorensen, on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are four experts in psychology here to bring you cutting-edge and science-based ideas to help you flourish in your relationships, work, and health. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, a clinical psychologist practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, and author of Act for Burnout, Act Daily Journal, and the Act Daily Card Deck. From America's heartland, I'm Dr. Emily Edlin, a clinical psychologist based in Chicago, Illinois, and author of Autonomy Supportive Parenting. Calling in from Vienna, Austria, I'm Michael Harold, act coach, confidence trainer, and author of an upcoming book on being a better conversationalist and making friends. And from coastal New England, I'm Dr. Jill Stoddard, author of Be Mighty, The Big Book of Act Metaphors, and Imposter No More. We hope you take what you learn here to build a rich and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. So... It's September 2024, and this is my 50th birthday month. I'm turning 50 this month. And so this is kind of a big existential moment in my life. And I am here to talk to you all today about midlife with my friend and colleague, Dr. Meg McKelvey. And I've been working a lot in my private practice with clients who are in midlife. And as I do this work. It's actually become more and more of a passion for me and something I love and a specialty area. And I think midlife is a really rich and interesting time of life. There's all kinds of things to think about. People go through a lot psychologically. And so this is just where my head has been for a while. I've been reading about this and thinking about it. And so for my birthday, I thought it would be a really meaningful thing for me to come together with Meg and offer this to our listeners and to anybody who might be going through midlife and to the people I know, you know, a lot of my friends are turning 50 soon or in the next few years or have recently turned 50. And so this is just something I wanted to pull together as a birthday gift to myself and to everyone who might be interested. And so let me say hi to Meg. Hi, Meg. Hi, Debbie. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, you're very welcome. And thank you so much for being here. I asked Meg to do this for me as her birthday present to me uh, was for her to join me in doing this episode. So I'm really grateful that that you're here, Meg. Uh, Well, there's nowhere I would rather be than having a deep existential conversation with you, Debbie, and in celebration of your 50th, which is really just such a big milestone. I'm just so delighted to share this with your listeners. And you bring so much to the world and so much to my life and so much to so many people's lives. It's just such an honor to share your birthday present with you and our listeners. Thank you. That's so sweet. I'm 
That's very touching. Thank you, Meg. Ah, well, before we dive into our existential conversation, um, I want to take a minute to introduce everyone to you, Meg. Meg has been on the podcast before, at last time a couple years back, to talk to us about belonging. It was episode 199, which is was an amazing episode. So check it out if you haven't if you haven't listened to that one before. We're going to talk a little bit about belonging today, and I'll also link to that episode on our show notes. Dr. Meg McKelvey is my good friend, and she's also a therapist, consultant, and trainer specializing in acceptance and commitment therapy and a co-founder of Impact Psychology Colorado. She earned her PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Prior to her work in private practice, she was a psychologist in the family program at the Rocky Mountain VA Medical Center, and she served as a nationally recognized trainer and consultant in cognitive processing therapy for trauma in the VA healthcare system. She's committed to decreasing suffering through a lens of ACT and understanding our yearning to belong, and she leads writing groups called Belonging from the Inside Out. So we're happy to have her back. And I want to just say a couple words here. Meg and I don't expect that we're going to give you the answers to midlife or that you're going to come out of this episode with all of your problems solved related to this this period of time. But we did want to provide you with some things to think about, just some ideas and questions that you can ponder. And toward the end, we're going to go through some different exercises and practices and things that we've done in our own lives and as therapists that we think might be helpful to anyone who's grappling with these kinds of issues. And to start us off, Meg, I want to ask you a question. What do you love about working with in midlife in your therapy practice? Ooh, it's such a juicy one to start with. My main mission is really to help alleviate suffering for people. And so I find that this time point uh, of midlife is this tremendous opportunity where people are coming in hungry for more tools and more understanding, more self-understanding, more understanding of the world, more understanding of their existential dilemmas. And it just feels people are so open in, in this, you know, crisis can be both danger and opportunity. And so there's just this openness as people face this crisis and this possibility of helping people gather some tools to face the rest of their life, not just midlife. Yeah, that's beautifully said. This openness and opening at this moment in time. And for me, I'll just add one more thing in my perspective, which is that As a therapist, I love the existential stuff. One of the very first clinical psych classes I ever took was existential psychology. And of course, as an ACT therapist, we talk about, you know, values and purpose. And we talk about some of these issues as well. But at heart, I think the existential stuff is what really keeps me excited as a therapist. And I think that it's just such a theme at this point in in our lives. And that is going to be a major theme in our conversation today is about some of the existential grapplings that happen. Yes, I love it. This is the stuff that we like to talk about. (laughs) It is. This is a dialogue between Meg and me. And this is kind of how we talk about these things. And it's fun to share it beyond the two of us. Absolutely. Before we dive into that dialogue, I want to start by going over a couple quick things about midlife. We're talking roughly about the middle third of life right now. So usually people think of that somewhere but around age 40 to around age 60 or 65, but it kind of depends. Of course, there's a classic stage theory by Eric Erickson, where he talks about generativity versus stagnation and how this is a time of life when we are making our mark on the world. And a lot of times we're caring for others and making a contribution for our work. So it tends to be a time when there's a lot of responsibility, adult responsibilities. What comes to mind for me about around midlife is the U-shaped curve of happiness and the marital happiness charts that you may be familiar with. So that, that there's typically high meaning in midlife, but it's also sort of some of the lowest type of day-to-day satisfaction. And it reminds me of the, I don't know, Debbie, if you remember the study about how parents were asked about global satisfaction as as being parents, and they report high levels of uh, global satisfaction as parents. 
but then they got pinged um, during the day. And it was so interesting is that their satisfaction in these uh, snapshots in time were actually quite low. So there's this contrast between maybe day-to-day levels of happiness and then global sense of meaning. Um, I don't know if you remember that from graduate school, Debbie. Well, I re- I do remember when that study came out about parenting. And, and the thing that stands out in my mind is that parents report feeling happier when they're doing these things like vacuuming and cleaning the toilet when, than when they're doing the hands-on work part of parenting. And yeah, most parents would say it's a meaningful thing. I wouldn't trade it for the world, but also really is hard. And recently, the Surgeon General came out with a report, I mean, just a couple of weeks ago about parental stress and how stressful and hard parenting can be. And I think there are a lot of areas of life that are like that in middle age. They're wonderful and meaningful and important, but they're also challenging and not always necessarily, or we're not always feeling the emotion of happiness when we're in these roles. So yes, and I think the whole U-shaped curve of happiness thing, I'm kind of obsessed with that because I think it is so validating that it really is a time when day-to-day life is maybe not as fun as it was in, say, your mid-20s. On top of that, we, of course, have also biological shifts of aging happening. Our bodies are aging. And a lot of times around middle age, people really start to feel for the first time they're looking in the mirror and they're seeing that change. They might start having more health concerns. And so one of the big things about middle age is making peace with body changes and the aging process. Absolutely. So oftentimes women over 40 or 50 talk about turning invisible in society and it can be really big shift or a sense of loss. And some women might find that to be a really hard adjustment and a sense of loss and not feel as good about themselves. I think what's interesting about that is that there's also an upside to it. And this is how I personally experience that, which is that I feel a little bit less focused on my appearance than I was when I was younger. And at this point in my life, attention based on my physical appearance isn't really something that I'm looking for. And I think there's something very liberating about that. It's kind of like, who cares? You know, this is just my body changing. It's fine. Um, What's really interesting, I think, is I saw this study that was looking at women in and women's health in midlife. And what they found really fascinated me. And that was that few women actually mentioned that menopause was really the most challenging aspect of midlife. So I think we sometimes have the stereotype that that menopause is the most chal- one of the most challenging aspects of midlife, but I was really interested to see that that the research did not support that. That is very interesting. If anybody wants more information or ideas related to men and because go back and check out episode 315 of the podcast because we did a whole episode on menopause and we'll talk about it a little bit today some of those biological changes but that episode is more focused on that so speaking of aging sometimes i think that the physical changes and the you know kind of your body's external displays of age can feel a little startling meg when you think of yourself like how old do you feel typically um i feel 31 and i feel i feel a lot of vitality what about you debbie well i think i kind of feel like i'm somewhere in my late 20s like 25 to 30 is how i almost picture myself or that's how i feel And it's funny because once in a while I look in the mirror and it's like, uh, no, that's not the case. And also I look at pictures of myself when I was that age and it really is drastic how much I've changed or I'm around an actual 25 year old and I'm like, yeah, I'm a lot older than that. And actually, I has this ever happened to you? I looked at there was an actor that who I won't name because I don't want to shame anybody. But this is an actor who's been around a while. And I saw a picture of him recently. And I was like, wow, he look, kind of looks like an old man. I wonder how old he is. And he's two months younger than me. And I was like, oh, yep. Uh huh. That's right. But I, I kind of felt I had this sense of like, he looks old. Has that happened to you before? Yeah. You know, you grow up with these actors and then they're like starting to take on sort of like more matronly or grandfathery roles. And it's just, it is shocking. It's an indicator that time is passing. 
Yeah. You realize, yes, it is a marker. It's like it's such an indicator of time passing and it's a marker for something that is hard to, for sometimes for your brain to actually quantify or be, or understand. So an example of that is that I teach adaptive skiing and I started teaching in 1998. And, um, now I have instructors that I volunteer under who were not born when I first started teaching adaptive skiing. And, that is just a, a mind bender to me. Like my mind has a hard time wrapping itself around that. And I, I tend to stumble around a little bit with that when I, when we, it's kind of a funny interpersonal moment when we realize that and it, it's hard to wrap your brain around. Well, and I do think sometimes people actually, for instance, you know, I'm turning 50 this year. Sometimes people get really depressed about those numbers. I know people who have almost hidden it or lied about it because they don't want people to know because they're shame. They want to pretend like they're younger. For me, I am I really try to look at it as like, I am still alive and I have friends who weren't so lucky, you know, friends who died young and didn't make it to 50. And, and I don't, I'm not always in this place, but I really like to appreciate that I have the chance to get older. I would rather age and get older than not. And I know it's more complicated than that probably for all of us. But I think that there sometimes there is that sense of, I don't know, ageism that is out there that we kind of internalize like it's a bad thing. So I think it's also interesting to think about some of the cognitive changes that happen over the course of time as well. Yeah. So I love when I was doing some research about this, I loved my finding in Google Scholar that there was something about how 48 is like peak cognitive time. And, and then when I looked further, there was some controversy about what, what the actual age is, but that was, that was heartening when I saw that. And it reminds me of how I've heard from various people that they look for doctors that are between the ages of 45 and 55. So sort of that there is this prime cognitively in some ways, but I think there's a little bit of controversy as to what the cognitive prime is actually. Yeah. And I think if you think about the different domains of cognition, some of them certainly slow down. You know, I think most people will report a little bit more trouble remembering certain things. Maybe it takes a little longer processing speed, but there are types of intelligence that continue to grow well past 48, especially wisdom. And maybe that's what people are looking for when they're looking for their doctor is someone who has some experience under their belt and some wisdom in the world. And interestingly, I've learned recently that humans are one of the only animal species. There's a few others, orcas, elephants, some other whale species where females live past menopause. And biologists have this thing called the grandmother hypothesis. They think that it's because these are all highly social species with big brains. And so wisdom is worth it, like social learning and the wisdom of experience that they can pass on to younger you know, whales, elephants, humans, that that is actually worth it, worth the resources that it takes to keep them alive, even though they can no longer reproduce. So like evolutionarily, it doesn't make much sense, but it does if you think about the survival of the group and the wisdom that is offered by these older, you know, matriarchs. I love that. It just reminds me of my grandmother who lived to around 95 and just the amount of wisdom that I was just so lucky to receive from her. And there is so much value that we bring in these later years in life. Yeah. Yeah. There can also be a deepening of relationships with age, too, because sometimes you have these longer term relationships where there is a whole history. And some of those may be superficial relationships from earlier in life don't really stand the test of time. Of course, this doesn't always happen for every person or every relationship. But I was thinking as an example of this, I've been to three high school reunions. I love to go. I don't know why, but I think it's really fun for me to see people and learn about what they've been up to. And I was so struck. So the most recent one I went to was my 30th. And it wasn't that long ago. And comparing that to my 10th high school reunion where people, there was a lot of posturing, right? There was a lot of like, oh, what are you doing? Here's what I'm doing. People were kind of dressed up and trying to impress each other. And in my 30s, everyone was so real. It was kind of like, 
hey, I've been through some hard stuff. And and I know we all have in the last few years, but people were just so open talking about that. It felt really good because it felt deeper. Well, I just think that that life is so humbling. And I've, I've heard so many people talk about these sort of later reunions in the way that you're describing. Like everyone's had some hard times, some ups, some downs, and maybe are less focused on sort of how they look, which allows for some deeper connections to happen at some of those reunions. And I've, I've just heard people sort of being surprised by that. And so I love that. Yeah. You kind of imagine people from high school staying the same or something. And it's like, no, we've all been growing in our own separate lives. Yes. One thing that can be super helpful to think about in middle age is what are the fruits of your labor that you have planted earlier on that are now coming to fruition? What about for you, Debbie? What do you think of when you think of that? Well, I think the first thing that comes to mind when you ask that question is around work for me personally, because I put in a lot of years of school. I put in a lot of labor early in my career and even just in the last few years doing things like writing and that kind of thing, where now I'm in a place where I get a career that I enjoy without having to put in as much of that hard, grueling labor Sometimes I want to work hard. I might get excited about something and take on a project or something like that, but I have a little bit more choice and I don't really have to as much anymore. It feels, it feels like I getting the benefit at this point. Oh, I love that. How about for you? Yeah, I love that for you. I agree with that as well around hard work with work. Um, The example that comes to my mind is around parenting, like that. There's just been so many micro interactions and so many times trying to instill certain values and those kinds of things. And recently, my kiddo said something about watching a Disney movie, talking to me about how the main character had done a lot of bad things in the past, but he had really changed now and was moving forward and doing things differently. And like that, there are no bad people just bad behaviors or something like that. (laughs) And I was, I was just so moved by, uh, like, I felt this tremendous sense of relief that there, some of the messages that, that I've tried to instill are, are slowly percolating through. I love that when you have this indicator from your child that the things you care about and value as a parent are working their way in. It happens now, right? It's starting to happen. Well, and similarly, but I think on a slightly darker side, you know, yes, we reap the fruits of our labors in midlife. We also can think about the chickens coming home to roost. And James Hollis, who writes about midlife, and he has a book called Finding Meaning in the Second Half of Life. We're going to talk about him a little bit throughout the conversation today. He talks about how sometimes the things that you've been pushing away for decades or you haven't been dealing with will come up eventually. And sometimes midlife is the time when these unexamined problems or dark sides of yourself are on full display. And and it's almost like we are kind of confronted with them in middle age sometimes. It's like we can't really ignore it anymore in one way or another, whether it's some sort of problem that you're having or something like that. Here it is. And now I need to take a look at my behavior patterns and take a look at myself and maybe make some changes here. Right. Exactly. And I think that this is sort of a time that regret about paths not taken or mistakes made or disappointments can really show up. And I think in our culture, we really try to push away regret or sort of say we should just move on and move forward. But I think um, one of the things that can be really useful in midlife is actually really looking at regret and allowing regret to be part of your experience as a way to help you understand how you want to move forward and what's mattering to you. So you know, if, if you're getting the message that you need to just move on and try something different, uh, I guess sort of part of what I would encourage is to slow down a little bit and sit with some of the regret to see what the wisdom is there. I agree completely. And and it's partly to guide you in moving forward and, and thinking about, okay, what is it that that tells me about my values and about my future? But I also think sometimes people need to spend a little bit of time 
processing loss or processing the loss of the life they had imagined for themselves. And actually, that can be a really important piece, I think, of the psychological processes of midlife is sort of coming to a reckoning of that. Absolutely. where I am versus where I had wanted to be or hoped to be. Well, maybe also inside of that is um, that you're pointing to is is related to like ungrieved losses. Like some of what might show up are some ungrieved losses that that really uh, need our attention and care in the transition. And that maybe part of what is holding us back is that we have these ungrieved losses and 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 that that there's some signaling that's happening in our life that is pointing us back towards understanding some of and grieving some of these losses. Yeah. I think it's important to think about this in terms of what people often refer to as the midlife crisis. Because I think we a lot of times when people think of midlife that's what they think of is the crisis and we have a stereotype of what that means. I think you could almost picture this 48-year-old man who buys a Porsche and dyes his hair black and ditches his wife for a younger woman. Or I don't know, There's a, there must be a portrayal of that in the movies somewhere or something, because I think that's what people think of a lot of times when they think of the midlife crisis. And by the way, there's some controversy about that. Even some people who research midlife say it's a myth that it's not that common to have that type of midlife crisis where you just upend everything and can't deal. And I think it's really important to point that out, right? That that none of this is universal. Some people don't go through an especially tough time or questioning or anything like that. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it is. Part of it is is some of the mid, sort of the midlife crisis or some of what we grapple with existentially, is there some privilege inside of that, right? Like that, are we, if, if you don't have a, if you're struggling to feed your family, if you're struggling with severe mental illness, if you're struggling with extreme racism or sexism, like, are you, are you able to have, are you able to rumble with some of these ideas and existential dilemmas? Maybe, maybe less so. Yeah. I mean, you think about, you remember the hierarchy of needs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's like, if your basic needs aren't being met or you're struggling, looking for personal fulfillment may not be your biggest problem, right? If you're feeling dissatisfied because you have everything you need, but you're, you're feeling a sense of, well, now what, or, I thought I'd be happier than this or more fulfilled, you know, that probably does suggest that that you have your basic needs met most of the time. Yeah, it's reminding me of the French term ennui, right? That there's sort of a luxury in having ennui because it means that your basic needs are being met and that you're sort of bored and listless. So just thinking about keeping in mind the privilege that might be involved in this. One of the ways that I think about it, though, instead of necessarily thinking about a midlife crisis, it can sometimes feel like a crisis to people. But I really think of it as this existential shift, like this internal existential shift that happens that is, you know, some questions come up, some some challenges come up that are hopefully followed by a greater sense of wisdom and clarity and kind of a reconnection and reclaiming of the self. And middle age isn't even necessarily the important part of it. It's not like a moment in time. It's more like something happens. And it could be one of these many, many transitions that happen in midlife, right? It could be empty nest, divorce, aging, a big birthday, parents aging and dying. You know, there's all kinds of different things that can happen. Just this realization that your life is halfway over probably, you know, statistically speaking, it probably is, but somehow it becomes real. And there is this question that emerges. It just often happens around this time of life. Yeah, I think that for me, one of the things that's so uh, compelling about this time in life is that is that we do find ourselves sometimes uh, uh, more willing to look at our mortality. I mean, I think it's interesting in terms of even parenting, right? I have certain number of, of, of holiday breaks left. I've got a certain number of summers left. Things become more uh, concrete in in terms of time, and you know, I have this many years towards retirement. It just all becomes so much more real, and 
that can be can feel daunting, but it also can be this tremendous opportunity to really look at what matters to us and what we want to bring into our life in the second half. Yeah. Well, and one of the most important ways in which we can enter into this existential moment is when there's a challenge to our sense of self. And so we all have areas where our ego identifies us really strongly with something, something about ourselves that just feels really important to us. And at some point in life, there's going to be a challenge to that. And that's often the thing that kind of underlies all of these things that we're talking about here. It's this disruption or this challenge to our sense of identity and to our ego. And so let me give you a couple of examples. And Meg, maybe you have some examples as well. So that really, really caring and engaged parent becomes an empty nester. Or someone is really focused on their career and they're laid off or they retire. Or, you know, someone who really cares about their appearance notices their body aging or their libido is going down and and that's an important part of their marriage you know their physical intimacy is an important part of their marriage or they just imagine their life going one particular way and it's not going the way they had pictured themselves yeah i mean i think we can we see, i see this a lot where we can identify as someone who has always been chased after or is a catch someone who is a distance runner you know, we can have these certain identities and, and as we move into midlife, sometimes we no longer are, are able, for example, to be a distance runner, we might have to cut back our mileage, or we might get injured, you know, those kinds of things. And, you know, what happens when we grapple with or rumble with these aspects of our identity? Do, are we able to become more flexible in our identity? Yeah. And I think that this can be a hard process. So it can be really hard to shift on this. It takes some, I think, some growth and some flexibility. And you might have to go through a tough time to get there. But on the upside, you really can become more flexible in your view of yourself and reconnect with yourself in a different way. You know, just using your runner example, if you put so much of your identity into being a runner, that that I mean, this is a little bit hypothetical, but like you put so much of your identity identity into I'm a runner. It's like, what other aspects of yourself are there? And can you get to know other parts of yourself maybe in a different way if that shifts? And so it can actually be life expanding and life enhancing to do this. Right. And I think what comes to mind for me around like thinking about the distance runner example is that you know, let's say we become injured as a distance runner, or we are in certain kind of dance or martial art, and we become injured. You know, one of the things that can be so fruitful is to really slow down and better understand what it is that this part of ourselves gives us. So for example, if you're a distance runner, like what does distance running give you? Like, what is it that you're longing for that it gives you? So does it give you peace or does it give you, um, a sense of mastery, right? Like if we can slow down, we can become more unhooked from these specific things that define us and, and zoom out and better understand what it is that our longings are around this. And I think we'll talk about this a little bit more, but just wanted to start the part of this conversation about really moving into doing some self-reflection and slowing down and better understanding our relationship with some of these things. Uh, yeah. And I think that what you're pointing to here is how it's through the process of grappling with that and questioning it that the growth and and self-understanding can happen. It's it's sometimes uncomfortable and uncertain. And it's not like there's this clear answer to these types of questions, but it's a way of getting to know yourself better through even asking a question like that. Like, what does this tell me about myself, about what I'm longing for? And you can skip over this process or just try to answer it really quickly. But if you do that, you miss out on the wisdom and self-understanding that can be gleaned from that process. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That that when we get really attached to one of these roles, like 
runner or mother or therapist, when one of these roles inevitably changes, that we can end up in this place of feeling lost and confused. And it can feel so tempting to jump to the next thing or kind of try to escape some of the discomfort of that. Well, now I'm a golfer or now I'm this or now I'm that. But there's just this there's opportunity inside of this to really to rumble with some of what we're longing for and what um, some of these roles have given to us through our lifetime. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and this is where it's it's really an inner shift. It's an inside job, as they say, right? It's not always this big dramatic upheaval that you might think of. It's not even necessarily something that results in a major drastic change. There might be small changes. Like maybe you start an old hobby again. You're suddenly you're practicing the piano in the mornings before you go to work or something like that. Maybe it's all internal, right? But there is this kind of internal shift that happens and a shift in perspective. And to me, that's the most important and interesting part of this is like that internal thing that you're you're referring to there. Cultures around the world have myths where there's a hero's journey or a heroine's journey. You know, that the hero or heroine goes through this place and gets to the other side transformed in some type of way. And they almost always have a descent, right? They have some sort of challenge. Maybe the hero or heroine has to descend into darkness for a bit as part of the journey. And I think that's the process internally that's happening. Absolutely. I know we both are big fans of uh, Maureen Murdoch. And here is a quote that she describes this process beautifully. During this part of the journey, the woman begins her descent. It may involve a seemingly endless period of wandering grief and rage and dethroning kings, of looking for the lost pieces of herself and meeting the dark feminine. It may take, take weeks, months, or years And for many, it may involve a time of voluntary isolation, a period of darkness and silence, and of learning the art of deeply listening once again to self, of being instead of doing. The outer world may see this as a depression and a period of stasis. Family, friends, and work associates implore our heroine to get on with it. Yeah. And that's from, so Maureen has been on the podcast before. Um, We can link to her episode and her book, The Heroine's Journey is kind of about this process. And she really writes about the internal sense of emotional tumult that might happen as you face loss, disappointment, physical changes. And that is the descent right there. So you go through the descent, right? And then the goal of the journey isn't to come to a resolution. It's it's not like the end of it is all neat and tidy, but you do want to get to a place of being more aware and awake. Again, having kind of that loosened sense of yourself, like the ego loosening its grip and being less tied to a rigid sense of yourself. And it's through living these questions over the course of time in a values consistent way and kind of integrating it that's where it's transformative. Yeah, I think exactly. I think that part of what can happen is that we can learn to look at whether we're moving towards what matters to us or away from discomfort. And that framework can really help us as we navigate midlife and beyond. Well, listeners, I've officially been in New England for two years, and once again, it is my favorite season. The leaves on the trees are stunning, and the air is crisp and cool, and you know what that means. It's time for cozy fall clothes. And there's no place that does cozy better than Quince. Last year, I bought their Mongolian cashmere turtleneck sweater dress. Now, normally cashmere makes me super itchy, but not the cashmere from Quince. It is so super soft. I love to pair this dress with my tall boots, and I especially love that it was way more affordable than a lot of other cashmere. How is Quince able to do that? By partnering directly with top factories and cutting out the cost of the middleman, which passes the savings on to us. I already ordered another cozy top that I can't wait to get into. So join me and get cozy in Quince's high-quality wardrobe essentials. Go to quince.com slash POTC for free shipping on your order and 365-day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash POTC to get free shipping and 365-day returns. Quince.com slash POTC. Amazfit smartwatches are among the top four smartwatches in the United States. 
Launched in 2015, AmazeFit has 42 million active daily users and are available in 90 countries. Just pair it with the five-star rated Zep app, and it tracks your steps, workouts, oxygen, and sleep. I know my sleep is top priority for my overall health, so I love that I can get a sense from my AmazeFit watch the quality, not just quantity of my sleep. You can insert variables like alcohol before bed to see if there are patterns with quality of sleep and track your wake-up mood. And have I mentioned the battery life? It lasts an epic 10 to 14 days. Support Psychologists Off the Clock by ordering yours from www.amazefit.com slash P-O-T-C, promo code P-O-T-C. That's www.amazefit.com slash P-O-T-C, promo code P-O-T-C. I think at this point in the conversation, we want to move into some how, right? So questions and suggestions to think about in terms of how to tap into that process. Exactly. I think that this is one of the things that as Debbie and I were talking about this podcast that we really wanted to leave the listeners with is sort of some of the questions that you can rumble with that you can really work with for yourself and kind of think of how these things might apply for you. And in transitioning to that, there's a Roka quote that really helps us open up this section and think about some of these questions. So the quote is, I want to beg you as much as I can, dear sir, to be patient towards all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves like lock rooms and like books that are written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually without noticing it live along some distant day into the answer. So what we're moving into is asking you and we're doing ourselves to lean into some of these questions and then lean into them again and again and not try to push through towards some kind of big answers and being really just willing to sit with the discomfort of the uncertainty to some of these dilemmas that we all face as human beings. I love that. And one of the things that's really an important element of that is to get better at listening to yourself. You know, I mentioned James Hollis earlier, who wrote Finding Meaning in the Second Half of Life, and he describes it as learning to listen to the yearnings of the soul, that you have to step out of the stimulus and response of daily life and just all the hubbub and busyness and tune into yourself and to pay attention to what your psyche is telling you. Can you think of an example of that, Debbie? Like, Yeah, there are a lot of examples. Actually, to tip off my example, I'm going to give you this quote by Rashida Jones, who the actress and comedian who was just on the Smartless podcast recently. And she described it so well. She said, my greatest gift is continuing to develop my inner life, something that's not, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a bit, something that's not connected to anybody else, creating almost like a little house inside, whether it's meditation or breath, whatever it is, nature, that's self-sufficient and not reliant on external approval or gratification. Wise words from Rashida Jones. I think the example that comes to mind is just creating this little space in your life, the little house she talks about, to kind of tune into yourself. You can do that through meditation, writing, nature. I mean, we can talk a little bit more about some of these things, but I think it's just giving yourself a little bit of stillness and quiet to become more attuned to yourself. It's so much reminding me of the Derek Walcott poem, Love After Love. Um, I'll just pull it up and read it for our listeners. Okay. Love After Love. The time has come when with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door in your own mirror and each will smile at each other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from your bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes, Peel your own image from the mirror. Sit, feast on your life. So good. So that 
that poem just reminds me of this process that really Rashida is talking about is really just about befriending ourselves. And the, you know, part of befriending ourselves has to do with coming back into our bodies and, you know, in a culture that values uh, sort of all the doing of, of capitalism coming back into just being in our bodies. And so there's so many practices that many of you are probably aware of yoga, Tai Chi, meditation, body scans, all those kinds of things. But the basic inquiry here is what is it that I'm noticing in my body and what kinds of signals is my body telling me about physical challenges, but also about emotional, what's, what kinds of emotions are showing up in your body and what does my body need? Does it need in the second half of life? What does my body need? Does it need to run, walk, stretch, eat more fiber? Does it, do you have an injury that needs attention and how can I relate to my body as it changes? Um, and one of the things I love hearing you talk about, Debbie, is around body neutrality. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? This is just something that I always love you hearing you talk about. Yeah, I think body neutrality is about how we always get caught up in this internal argument within ourselves about our body and how it should look. And is our body good enough or not good enough? And, you know, of course, there's the body positivity movement, which is more about accepting and being positive toward all body types and having, you know, kind of a high self-esteem around your own body. But I think body neutrality is about stepping out of that completely. You know, sometimes you might feel pretty good about your body. Sometimes you might not. But it's almost more looking at your body functionally, right? Like this is the body that I have that allows me to do the things I care about in the world and I want to take care of it. And sometimes I feel pretty positive about it. And sometimes I don't, but it's kind of, it's almost like stepping out of that internal argument within yourselves about whether your body is good enough or not good enough. I love that frame, Debbie. I just noticed that it's so more peaceful living in that space than it is in this debate of good or today I look fabulous or today I'm satisfied with this part of my body. It just is a really nice way to step out of that dilemma. Exactly. And I think there's so much cultural programming that goes into that and how we're supposed to look and what we're supposed to wear and all these things that that kind of get internalized within us. And this is exactly like you're saying, this is a way to kind of step out of that. It's a very different stance toward your body than we typically might take. Right. The body criticism, criticism backlash is to sort of be like, oh, no, my body is perfect and all these kinds of things. And that that can be fraught as well. Oh, fraught and also it's pretty unrealistic for most of us right it's yeah. the rare bird who truly feels that way all the time about yeah. themselves i think that that midlife gives us this opportunity to really start to to relate to ourselves possibly in a new way and and continue to ask ourselves just along those lines like what what feelings are here for me as i am in this challenging period of time um using some of your experiences of pain, sadness, loss, grief, anger. You know, we in our culture want to sort of bypass these feelings and find a way to feel better and, um, you know, no bad days or whatever, whatever the saying goes. And in fa- when in fact, you know, at, as we know from an ACT perspective, the, the feelings that we have are so much information and data and wisdom inside the feelings that they are actually the markers on the trail that help us identify what it is that's mattering to us. And so, you know, in our culture, we want to feel less anxious or we want to feel less depressed or we want to feel less angry. And so we rush through understanding what it is that our emotions are trying to tell us. And so what kind of Debbie and I are encouraging is just some taking some time, slowing down and having some inquiry about, well, what is it that the anger is telling you is, you know, as an example, are you a, uh, an environmental lawyer that is doing litigation for a large corporation? And are you starting to feel some burnout related to that? Some sense of it not being in line with your values? Are you angry at the company? Are you angry at yourself? 
or, or things like that, like that your anger is not something just to kind of breathe away or punch a pillow, like that it actually has this really important function in midlife that um, is a message and it's data, not noise. We had a similar conversation about regret earlier and not just trying to get rid of that, not living by the no regrets mentality, but rather looking at the wisdom behind those regrets. And I think you could say the same for most emotions, that there's something in there that's worth tuning into. Exactly. And and sometimes it's, you know, when people are coming in with anxiety and those kinds of things, sometimes there's the that there's actually, you know, a thyroid problem or, you know, the your hormones are out of balance. It's not just sort of psychologizing everything either, right? Like that you may be having experiences and changes in midlife that that are medical or need need attention. And so part of what we're suggesting more broadly is just slowing down and listening and seeing what's here and allowing yourself to make space for what it is that your body, the wisdom of your body. And it's really important here that in order to do that, we do have to have a little bit of stillness to be able to even tune into these emotions and notice them in the first place and to notice what's happening in our body. Yes. You know, John Kabat-Zinn talks about, are you a human being or a human doing? And I just think it's so addictive or um, rewarding in certain ways to just go, 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 go. And so part of the inquiry here is, are there ways that I can really slow down such that I can notice what's happening in my body and move out of doing mode where we are sort of like a walking checklist? I'm sure we've all had that experience where we sort of have a to-do list and we're just sort of going through life trying to check off all the things on our list. And we're moving more into just being, just, you know, sitting in our hammock or meditating or doing activities and things that don't have some sort of goal or end that is in some way productive. Well, and I think that that speaking of the to-do list, I think that oftentimes midlife is you know, not always, but often there is a desire in there to step out of that busy to-do list, high achieving mode. And so you're talking about finding these moments to be. And I think that in order to do that, sometimes we really have to examine our life as a whole and think about how am I living? And do I want to keep living that way? Or do I want to be more intentional about what I'm doing? And to step out of the to-do list mode do I need more spaciousness in my life to have a different type of meaning? I think as I shift out of achievement mode and more of goal-directed mode in midlife, there it makes room for so much, so many other things. I love the word you use, spacious. I noticed myself the other day having a lot of thinking while I was eating my lunch about how I could have more contact and connection with animals. And, you know, that was not a sort of goal directed conversation I was having with myself, but rather just something that I noticed that I was longing for. And so there's just a lot more space if we allow it to for other possibilities to show up. Yeah, I could see how right at this moment in your life, spending time with animals and having that and to reconnect with that part of your life might feel more interesting than the next work hurdle or the next work ambition that comes along. Absolutely. What what about you, Debbie? Yeah, I definitely there are a couple things that come to mind for me. The first is reading because I've always been someone who enjoys reading for pleasure and that's just lifelong has been one of my one of the activities I love the most. And for a long time, I was shortchanging. And I think at this point in my life, it's really important to me to have time to read. And so I'm carving that out instead of just hustle, hustle, work, work, work. I want to have time to just kick back and enjoy a good book. And I'm making it happen more. I love that. And I always, I I feel like that you're, you're always reading a number of books and it's always fun to hear which books you're doing. I noticed for myself that I, I've been doing like author studies where I will read like everything I can get my hands on from one author. And that just feels 
I don't think I had the bandwidth to even like no figure out how to get all the books right. previously. Um, so yeah, I love I love that you're making space for that. Like a deep dive into a rabbit hole of an yes. author. Yeah. Yes. Well, and then another thing for me is fun, family fun. And fun is a key word of that because I'm pretty hands-on with parenting. We're around each other a lot. You know, we're doing things together. But there's something about carving time for me and my family to, you know, go on a little weekend getaway or go for a hike or go to a water park or something like that where we're just, we're together, but we're doing things that are fun and enjoyable. And to me, there's so much vitality in that. And it's very hard to find time to do that when you're working all the time. Like when I was writing my burnout book, I'd have to spend my weekends a lot of times catching up on writing and missing out on family fun. And that's really when I feel most alive. And I just, I mean, those moments are not going to last forever when my kids are in the house and I can force them to go do fun things with me. And so that's another thing. It's like a reason for me to slow down with the hustle is to be able to just have fun. Yes. And, and that quality time. Uh, I so resonate with that, Debbie. For my birthday this year, I took my son to a Nuggets game. And I th- that was like a highlight of the last five years. It's so really making space for fun in our lives with our families is just such a, a sweet thing to be doing. Well, and I think it can be hard sometimes to prioritize that because of the cultural programming that we have to just be busy all the time and to be productive, that sometimes that's how we define our worthiness. And so sometimes it feels almost countercultural to make a conscious decision to do that, to prioritize chilling with a book just that you're reading for fun or, you know, going to the pool and splashing around all day when there's work to be done feels a little rebellious almost sometimes. It does. It like busyness in a culture where busyness is sort of viewed as equivalent to social capital or prestige or something like that. Yeah, actually, that reminds me of another quote by Maureen Murdoch from The Heroine's Journey. When the heroine says no to the next heroic task, there is extreme discomfort. When a woman stops doing, she must learn how to simply be. Being is not a luxury. It's a discipline. The heroine must listen carefully to her true inner voice. That means silencing the other voices anxious to tell her what to do. She must be willing to hold the tension until the new form emerges. So I want to say that quote because I do think that it's really important to note that sometimes it's an intentional shift. You have to choose to do this. It can feel like a hard thing to do and it might be worth it. Yeah, I think that this points to uh, conversations that we've had a lot that I would invite the listeners to contemplate around. If I stepped out of the rat race, or if I stepped out, uh, stepped out of all of the cultural messages about achievement, and I was allowed to be ordinary, you know, Ron Siegel wrote the book, The Extraordinary Gift of Being Ordinary. If I was allowed to be ordinary, what would I do now as I face midlife? What would what were would be some of the things that I would contemplate? Um, And maybe sort of that's an example, you know, of me contemplating how I can have more dogs in my life. Like that's just me wanting me me being fully willing to be ordinary. Then I can hang out with dogs more or things like that. And I'm not so caught up in the in the trappings of uh, achievement or whatever that is. And I think this goes back to that letting go of ego, right? Letting go of that desire to be special, the social comparison piece of things, like an awareness that you really start to feel that some of these things like your bank account or your, you know, how big your house is or how new your car is, they're not going to get you there, right? Those are not the things that are going to give you fulfillment and that we have to look at other ways to seek that. And I do recommend um, Ron Siegel's book, The Extraordinary Gift of Being Ordinary. And he came on the podcast a couple years ago, episode 257, because I think it's really profound. Yeah. I think that this also points us towards uh, an inquiry for ourselves around belonging, right? That, that, you know, we talked about this on the last episode when I came on and, and, and what, can be really fruitful is is to explore this yearning to belong this 
this biologically wired yearning that we have to belong as part of a, a larger whole and to be seen, to be known, to be cared about and how sometimes we can end up in a trap where we mismanage the yearning to belong. We, we, we sort of come up with the idea, you know, through our culture and our families that we need to be beautiful or smart or high achieving in order to belong. We need to be special. And this is what we call mismanaged belonging. So if we can explore our yearning to belong and, and, and see if we can step out of the ways in which we have hooked ourselves into achievement or being special or being attractive as measures of our belonging and reconnect with our birthright to belong, our natural way that we come into the world that we naturally belong, that we are, we don't have to earn love and belonging. You know, when a baby comes into the world, you know, the parents don't look at the baby and say, oh, wow, you're so smart. I love you. It's that you that the parents fundamentally feel have an experience of love for this being just for being alive. So if we can reconnect with that, we can identify ways in which we might be mismanaging some of our belonging, ways in which we might unhook from some of that and come back to our birthright to belong. We might think about the first half of our life as these ways in which we might have had some mismanaged belonging, but the second half of our life might be this tremendous opportunity to come back to ourselves and rumble with some of this mismanaged belonging and see if there are some things that we might let go of that we might no longer that no, might no longer serve us. So for example, if we are able through different ways to come back with our innate belonging, then we don't necessarily have to do all this achievement. And so there's some freedom that could come about through this inquiry about belonging. Meg, what you're saying right now about belonging and expectations reminds me of James Hollis again, who describes life in two halves. I mean, mm-hmm. not precisely half, but just kind of metaphorically speaking, the first half of life is about what people in the world expect of me and a provisional sense of self is formed, you know, you're still trying to figure out your place in the world. You're still trying to become an adult and fill your social contract and learn. And that's all fine and important. But then you move into the second half of life. And it's more about tuning into yourself, reconnecting with your authentic self and thinking, you know, what does the world want from me? What does my soul want from me? Why am I here in service to what? And stepping out of social expectations and things that were limiting us before and revealing new parts of ourselves. So I think that that there's this really nice conversation between James Hollis and this idea of belonging because, you know, we're talking about these yearnings, like what does the soul want? And, And that it's possible that some of the things that we've been doing in mismanaging our belonging, like achieving or trying to look smart or attractive, like those kinds of things in some ways have functioned for us, like the way diet Coke function functions for us when we are thirsty, right? That there's something satiating about it and then, um, sort of dissatisfying in the long term. And so part of what we're exploring here is finding ways to come into contact with the longing our soul's longing in its sort of pure form, as opposed Mm -hmm. to these sort of trying to belong in these different ways or trying to satisfy the needs of the culture in different ways. I think that's right. It's like, I'm really struck by that idea of earning belonging and that this is about kind of recognizing I don't have to earn anything anymore. Instead, I can shift. I mean, that's, that's really profound. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices 
down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes in detail. So Meg, you have an exercise that we alluded to earlier, but it can be really helpful for exploring some of this. I think sometimes we have these big life decisions or in midlife, these ways in which we are wanting big changes or have things that we're longing for. And there are times when we're not actually able to make those changes. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough. We are ambivalent about a decision. We don't know if we want to leave our partner. We don't know if we want to move out of the country exactly, but we have these longings. So let's say, for example, we long to move to Costa Rica, but we don't necessarily have all the resources to do that, or it's more complicated than that usually. So one of the things that can be really useful, aside from some of the more traditional ways of looking at that, would be to tune in to your body and imagine yourself moving to Costa Rica and imagining what that would give you. So what are the sensations that you notice in your body when you've moved there? What is it that it fulfills for you? So for example, is your longing to move to Costa Rica because you are longing for more calm? You are longing for more peace. You are longing for more contact, you know, you imagine yourself sort of walking on the beach, you're you're longing for more contact with nature. And so sometimes we have these daunting decisions or big longings, and it's not always the case that we can move in that direction, but we can move in the direction of really understanding the longing and seeing if there are other ways that we can meet those longings. I have a clinical example that comes to mind when someone's been in a long-term marriage and maybe they're not feeling super satisfied by it and they might be tempted to leave the marriage or possibly to have an affair with somebody that's in their life that feels more exciting or, you know, a coworker or someone from their past or something like that. And I think sometimes you can decide this relationship is important to me, but you use that to tap for what is am I looking for? Well, maybe you're disconnected. Maybe you need a little bit more spark in your relationship. You need to get out of the same old, same old. So the longing could be something around, I'm longing for closeness and excitement and something like that. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So what's behind that? Yes, exactly. So we talked earlier about how you can create space in your life. And and I think we've talked about a number of ways to do that. You know, just to kind of elaborate on that a little bit, you know, nature, meditation, walks, reading poetry, you can sometimes tap into this through creative expression art, poetry, dance, that type of thing as well. And I want to give a special nod to writing because I think, Meg, we both have an interest in writing. We both do a lot of writing on our own and have used it therapeutically. So for me, I find that doing personal writing is a way to connect with myself. And I have a writing practice. I'm not, you know, religious or rigid about it or anything like that, but I journal. I do all kinds of personal writing. We've talked about it on the podcast before. Um, And so, Meg, we both have this shared interest in writing. Tell me about your how you use writing to tap into some of this. So I'm really interested in memoir, the act of writing memoir, but not necessarily with the idea of publishing in mind or, you know, either way. But for me, one of the things that I think is a beautiful practice is using perspective taking in writing such that you're perhaps writing from the perspective of of a compassionate narrator. So being able to look back at aspects of your life that were challenging or traumatic or beautiful and writing about these experiences from this compassionate narrator, third person lens that is truly a softer lens perhaps And perhaps how you would tell a story about a best friend. 
So I think that there can be something really healing in in practices like that. What about you, Debbie? I also appreciate that type of writing. and But for me, the more regular practice I have is just journaling in this way, in more of an expressive writing kind of way. So like if I'm having a problem, it really helps me to sit down and just write about it, write about how I'm feeling, kind of frame my thinking around it, just sort of hash it out in writing. And so I do a lot of personal, a lot of days I wake up in the morning and I write first thing or sometimes later in the day, I'm not rigid about it. But I think there is something about putting your experiencing into words that can be healing and that can help you get more clarity. And to me, it just feels very grounding when I do it, especially when I do it as a regular practice. It's almost like a meditation. I want to read another quote by Maureen Murdoch. She said, we all need to tell our story and to understand our story. We all need to understand our passage from birth to life and then to death. We need for our life to signify, to touch the eternal, to understand the mysterious, to find out who we are. And Maureen, in her work on memoir, I think she is very clear about how you can use writing as a process to tap into that. Meg, tell us about some of the the offerings that you have around writing in your practice. I offer a writing workshop called Belonging from the Inside Out, and I use expressive writing to help people tap into some of their own internal sense of belonging. And I have people do expressive writing using prompts. And and then part of the practice is really being able to share some of what we've written without judgment and without evaluation. It allows for us to very much be seen and is a really nice complement to this type of work where you're really working with better understanding your internal world. We can link to that on our show notes today for anyone who might be interested in that. And on my Instagram, I post journaling prompts sometimes, and I think those can be helpful, and we'll link to that too. And then I also am using Substack more recently, and I'm going to be posting some guided writing exercises on Substack. And so if you are interested in writing as a method of existential exploration, and you don't know where to start, you might want to, you might find one of these resources helpful. We also have something else that we want to offer you together. This is a gift from me and Meg, which is we think that there are a lot of questions you can ask yourself to enhance a little bit of soul searching along the way. And these can be used. You can think of maybe journaling about some of these things or just pondering them, you know, thinking through some of these questions. We were going to run through these questions, but what we're going to do instead is actually type them up and put them on our, both of our websites. So drmegmckelvey.com and drdebbysorensen.com and make them available to you to download so that you can look at them at your own time and kind of work through them at your own pace. And our hope, again, if you really like sitting with the questioning is that these are questions you can return to again and again that can help you explore yourself and do some soul searching. Debbie, one of our most meaningful and favorite conversations is around mortality. And we've been having this conversation probably since I've known you. So for many years, we've been having this conversation. And as we get closer to midlife or our midlife, it becomes something that just keeps getting more and more salient. And so I'm wondering, what are the ways, Debbie, that you find yourself using mortality, moving, staying close to mortality in your life as you move towards turning 50? For me, I think that just keeping that in mind, right, that I'm not going to live forever, it helps me appreciate the moment a little bit more. I think it gives me, you know, I try to consciously tune into it sometimes because it's not always present for me. You know, I've stop. I don't think about it constantly or anything like that. But when I do, it's almost like a savor this. This isn't going to last forever. Yeah. So it's interesting because when the pandemic was hitting, I had signed myself up for a death meditation retreat. And so that felt really important at that time moment. And it was so interesting because I sort of joked that I guess I didn't need to go on a death meditation retreat because it's a little dark humor, just that COVID sort of brought uh, our mortality into focus for all of us. And I think it's, in. I sort of look back on that, however many, I guess that was four years ago or whatever. 
And I look back on that and, and no longer feel the need for a death meditation retreat. Like it feels more salient to me just, just in these past four years with COVID and, and having aged myself five more, four more years that it's interesting that shift of just um, how the salience of our mortality can come into view and ha- we can have sort of a closer relationship with it in a short period of time. So I just, I'm noticing that. That's beautiful. And I do think that it it serves as a guide. You know, yeah. we know that the clock is ticking and that we only have so much time. And back to that idea of the existential shift. I mean, that's that's a big one to just remind yourself this is none of this is going to last. I think part of this experience of holding mortality so close is that I there's a natural softening towards myself and a natural forgiveness, self-forgiveness that can arise out of that, right? If you experience things to be sort of more fleeting, is there potentially in this process a softening towards ourselves? Yeah, there's like a self-acceptance, including all the hard parts of our life, all the inadequacies or the things about ourselves that we don't like, or the things that we haven't quite figured out yet, or the ways in which we're bumbling around and, you know, we just don't have it together yet, even though we've lived for quite a few decades by now. Yeah, actually, I can think of two examples of this, Debbie. The first one is that our sort of fun, like injecting humor into this, right? Like that you and I often will send each other pictures of a mess in our house and laugh at ourselves. And it's very, you know, then you'll send me one back and we just have a good laugh about it. And there's just like a lot. Oh yeah, like the one where uh, my dirty clothes pile and my clean clothes pile had gone so big they like merged (laughs) and I sent you a picture. That was a good one. Could no longer tell which was which. (laughs) That sounds very familiar. Yes. Yeah. Uh Yeah. The other example that I'm thinking about is when we were consulting about a case recently and and we were just talking about this like art of in therapy of sometimes you're sort of circling around something and like you don't land it for a little while. And like how I think I just it's like in midlife, is there more room for accepting that we are both you know, sort of at our prime in our careers and also sort of not perfect and, and, and just trying things out and like being Mm -hmm. able to hold both of those things isn't, can't that be like a real true gift of being willing to hold that you're an expert and that you sort of circle around some things sometimes or, or miss things or whatever. Yeah, I was thinking about that. You know, it's it's also true in, re- true in relationships. My husband and I went out for an anniversary dinner and we're like, oh, we still care about each other. You know, we were having this moment later and two days later, we're bickering about random stuff and just thinking both of those are true at once. And it, it's the acceptance of both, right? Like you can love and care about someone and also struggle with them at times. And one of the things that we're also bumping up against, which we've talked about a little bit, is kind of how you imagine things will be versus reality, right? Like we have this vision in our mind of how things are going to be. And when that's not quite the same as what we're experiencing in our life, it's almost like we need to make room for the reality of things and to to sort of let go of that comparison to this ideal that we think we should be meeting. So I think like, and it, you know, as a parent and a therapist and a friend, you know, I have these imagined uh, ways that are not perfect. I'm not sort of hoping for perfection, but I have, uh, I'm not silly enough to hope for myself to be perfect, but I do have sort of maybe ideas of sometimes about how things might play out. You know, if I work really hard to do something skillful parenting wise, and then like you're child comes at back, you know, you're really empathic and your child comes back at you saying like, oh, well, that's just like therapist-y or something. And you're, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like unexpectedly you're working so hard and you're doing the quote unquote right thing or whatever it is. And like, it just doesn't unfold how you imagined. And, you know, not to mention all the ways in which you make mistakes that, you know, obviously you're not necessarily anticipating that, but 
Ann Patchett has written uh, some about this in, in regard to her writing, and it's really spoken to me. Um, so I'll read a quote. Forgiveness, the ability to forgive oneself. Stop here for a few breaths and think about this because it is a key to making art and very possibly the key to finding any semblance of happiness in life. Every time I have set out to translate the book or story or hopelessly long essay that exists in such brilliant detail on the big screen of my limbic system onto a piece of paper, which let's face it, was once a towering tree crowned with leaves and a home to birds, I grieve for my own lack of talent and intelligence every single time. Were I smarter, more gifted, I could pin down a closer facsimile of the wonders I see. I believe more than anything that this grief of constantly having to face down our own inadequacies is what keeps people from being writers. Forgiveness, therefore, is key. I can't write the book I want to write, but I can and will write the book I am capable of writing again and again throughout the course of my life, and I will forgive myself. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So can we forgive ourselves and move towards the the thing that matters to us and do the thing that matters to us, even though it's not how we had imagined? Yeah. Can we accept that? I also think there's something to be said here about identifying our inner conflicts that are just going to keep going over the course of time and making friends with them, right? So some of these conflicts that show up repeatedly will never go away. And as an example for myself, I have this tension, I would call it maybe a conflict between this drive and this high achieving part of myself that gets really excited about things and wants to take on all this work and projects and fun things, and my desire to slow down and spend more time in other areas of my life and and not work so much. And I used to feel like I had to resolve that, right? Like I had to find the right balance there. And I had to somehow figure this out for myself. And I think as I get older, I realize that these are just two sides of me. And this is not something I'm ever going to resolve. It's just there's going to always going to be this back and forth and this tension here. And it's kind of like navigating that and being intentional about it that matters, right? So for instance, I can be more intentional and recognize when I'm going too far one way or the other, but that I'll probably, I mean, maybe someday I'll be freed of this, but I think this is just something that's going to be with me. And there's something about making peace with that that has really helped me. It's like, it's still there, but it, I don't feel, I don't know, bunched up about it anymore. Yeah. Well, I think you don't ha- like when you let go of having to resolve the conflict, there's some things that creates a lot of peace in that just yes. this recognition that there's going to be this sort of dance and yep, you're going to, you're going to always be kind of working with that. And like, our, it, and what a beautiful practice to just keep continuing to come back to that and ask yourself, where am I in this tension? Like, where am I? Yeah. Yeah, and you adjust as necessary when things go a little too far one way or the other. Exactly. Another thing that can be super fruitful is really exploring your relationships. So getting to know yourself inside of your relationship. Are you people-pleasing? Do you hide inside of relationships? Do you notice a sense of feeling lonely even though you're surrounded by people? And what are the stories that you're telling yourself about yourself that can get in the way of reaching out or connecting if you are feeling lonely? So I think really becoming familiar with the inner workings of your mind that I call some show tunes, sort of these things that pop up that we become more familiar with about while we examine ourselves in our relationships. And also just stepping out of people pleasing mode that you may have been in for a long time. Just I have a friend who called it her um, F it 50s right? Like kind of getting to this place of like, I don't have to go along with things that don't resonate for me or that don't meet my needs. I can speak up. Yes. I love that. And one of my dear mentors, he, as a therapist has really shown me the importance of not sort of getting into this mode of self-sacrificing or being a martyr. So it's really can be useful to watch are the mentors in our lives who may be further along, maybe in their 60s or 70s. And, and how are they, how are they navigating some of these issues? 
Well, and a final note that I think is along those lines is about doing some of this thinking in community, right? We've had conversations. This is a dialogue between the two of us. You can have healthy communities. You can look toward elders, but you can also connect with other people going through this process, people who have wisdom to share or people who can just support you as you go through this. And I think that that can be incredibly fruitful. Like it's nice to have that little house within your side of yourself, but it's also nice to connect with other people through this process and find a shared experience here. Absolutely. So this has been a long conversation, but a really important one. And thank you for the birthday gift, Meg, for for doing this with me. Happy birthday, Debbie. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. If you enjoy our podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review or contributing on Patreon. You can get more psychology tips by subscribing to our newsletter and connecting with us on social media. We'd like to thank our podcast production manager, Shadeen Stout-Williams. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources page of our website, offtheclockpsych.com.